Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland Public Television with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where tonight we're talking about a, 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 an issue that's really sad. It's sad that it's happening in our culture. It's even sadder that it's happening right here where we live in central Minnesota. And the topic is sex trafficking. And um, we're going to find out what is that definition. What are we, when we say sex trafficking, we're not just talking about adult prostitution. We're talking about things that are happening with very, very young girls. Um, and it's it's something that's probably more prevalent than we, the average person is aware of. So hopefully from this program tonight, we'll have a better understanding of what sex tra trafficking is. Can't say it, but, and what we can do about it. Um, my guests this evening are Naomi Nelson, who is with Lutheran, Lutheran Social Services, can't hardly talk here this morning, <laughs> and Jen Exted, who is the Chief of Police at Baxter. Yes. Thank you both for coming on our show. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. And you asked me to ask this question, <laughs> what is sex trafficking? So let's just start out with, what are we defining here as sex sure. trafficking? And our focus for the most part this evening is going to be on central Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, and I think you brought up a really good point already. Like, people have an idea of what prostitution is. And so I think that's kind of the social stigma is an understanding of prostitution. Um, which actually could translate to sex trafficking. But what we're going to be talking about, I think, here is more the minor commercial sexual exploitation, which is this big umbrella term, which sex trafficking falls underneath. And so what that is, is when something of value is exchanged with somebody else for a sexual activity. And this could be something of value, could be a place to stay. It could be a kid that needs, um, you know, is maybe on the run or it's cold in, in Minnesota and, and they're homeless or don't know how to place, have been kicked out for whatever reason from their home. And somebody offers them a place to stay and they might trust them and say, all right, you know, I know you from my community. Maybe you're somebody that's in my church or my school. Um, but then the expectation is that there's a sexual activity that is exchanged for them for a place to stay. This is kind of two party involvement. When we move into sex trafficking, we're looking at three parties that are involved. There we have a trafficker who is kind of the controller, um, which often people will know this as the pimp. So we have a pimp and then we have a youth who is um, who we consider to be the victim of this crime. And then we have buyers, who sometimes we call Johns. Um, but we're trying to kind of change that terminology so we have the trafficker, um, the youth or the victim, and then we have a John who is the buyer of, of commercial sexual exploitation. And so again, this can be kind of on this small, um, this small micro level where we have maybe a mother who is feeding a drug addiction and she doesn't have any money to give her her drug dealer and so she offers her daughter for an hour and says hey you can have my daughter for an hour and then in, in exchange i'm going to get my drugs it's not always money it can be anything of value it can be drugs a place to stay transportation um, it can be money as well then we can move into more of this big level um, where there could be a trafficker who is exchanging um, exchanging money with a buyer and there could be six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen different youth that are forced into a situation or coerced into a situation that they're essentially being raped by these people in order to um, for the trafficker to get money. So it is the supply and the demand. It is kind of this business that the traffickers are operating, which is then considered sex trafficking. So the the work that you folks do, is it with age groups? Under than a cer under <clears throat> certain age, so we're not talking about sure. necessarily a 35 year old. Sure. Um, and, and we do kind of work with both. However, mm -hmm. um, under Minnesota state law, it is still um, part of what the safe harbor law that was passed in 2011 said is that a child can no longer be considered a child prostitute. And so they're considered a victim. And that is 18 or under the age of 17 years old. And so when they are a minor, they cannot be criminalized. Over the age of 18, they still can. Um, but I think if I would speak to law enforcement, often now they're, they're wondering and asking the question, is this something um, that really is choice? Or is this something that maybe they were coursed at the age of 15 and now they're 19 years old? And should we be charging them? Do they have a pimp or a controller in place? Um, and so it's trying to understand the story. Um, and if I, I just don't think anybody wakes up and says, hey, I'm gonna sell myself for sex someday. Um, that's not really that dream somebody has. And so it's understanding the topic. Yeah, and, and what, it, what it has been for us over the last three, four, five years 
in law enforcement, not just in this area, but across the state is kind of a paradigm shift along with the, the juvenile protections under the safe harbor law, the change in the language, the decriminalization of prostitution that forced us as law enforcement to complete that paradigm shift and, and view them as victims and not the offenders, you know. So when we started getting into this about two and a half, three years ago here locally, um, we weren't targeting specific issues related to juvenile sex trafficking, but kind of the whole feeder system. Um, we know that uh, prostitution and solicitation is happening in the adult world, but those individuals are going to be the ones that are probably gonna venture off into the juvenile world at some time too, or may already be doing that type of stuff. So we wanted to kind of start, you know, getting at the, the root of the problem, which is just the, the act of prostitution. And in Baxter specifically, we own the problem because we had the nine, 10 motels in town. And historically, that's kind of been where it's been happening over the last 15, 20, 30 years. Um, one thing that kind of pushed us to going back a little bit further, I'd say now maybe eight to 10 years, across the state, some of the bigger agencies, Duluth, Rochester, St. Cloud, um, Moorhead, those agencies were starting to do the details. Kind of what I just explained, a little bit ahead of everybody else, they have more resources more personnel, bigger problems. But as they did that, they would push the problem out of their area and it doesn't go away. It, it, it just migrates somewhere else in the state. And we found out that a lot of it was migrating here to our area. And that's kind of how we started and, and got rolling on it. So what, why do you think it is migrating to this area? Uh, four years ago, we weren't addressing the issue, you know, so <clears> it, um, after we started addressing the issue um, in various different ways, but um, we made contact with a, a female victim who was working out of one of our hotels. Um, in the course of the three hours that we were watching, there was four individuals who paid a visit to her room. Um, we interviewed her afterwards. She wasn't charged, um, but she told our investigators, she said, you really, cramp my style up here. You know, I used to make $2,000 in a day easy. I'm struggling to make $800, $900 in a day now. Wow. And, you know, we, we kind of knew that. We suspected things like that were going on. But to finally hear it firsthand, you know, it, it was still eye-opening at that point. Well, I guess. Yeah. $2,000 a day. Yeah, and this was coming from uh, a lady who was just shy of 30 years old. And she had a home, or she lived with actually her parents in a Northwest Metro uh, city. And she would leave her kids with her mom in the morning and travel. We were one of the destinations for her, you know. So about every, once every three, four weeks, she'd, she'd be up here, um, make her money. But we were one stop in a, you know, kind of a, a circuit that she had going. Um, I, I used to work in a college and we had a law enforcement program <clears throat> and I don't believe I remember the curriculum focusing very much on this problem. So no. this is new for you to learn how to start coping with this, I would guess, for, yeah. for police departments. It was, yeah, well, it, <laughs> prostitution has always been on the books, sure. but this was a full 180 on how to deal with it. And, and what we did locally, we started kind of two groups, we had the law enforcement group who was going to address a problem. And then we created kind of an advocacy group on the backside to support law enforcement and to support that paradigm shift that we were going through because the prosecutors had to learn that they, they needed to rethink the way they were going to frame up the prosecution. You know, we, we're not gonna call them prostitutes, we're gonna call them victims because that's what they are. Like Naomi said, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I want to be a prostitute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were, we were addressing it that way. And, and I don't want to say it was a struggle, but it was, it was a big change. But, um, you know, it threw some pretty hard work. Um, we seemed to deter at least the adult issue early on. And 
to date, we haven't had any criminal prosecution of any juvenile crimes here in, in our local area, um, but we're not too naive to believe that it's still not, not going on. And, and that's why, you know, law enforcement, it's, it's hard to justify or quantify sometimes the work that you do. Is it paying dividends? Well, we kind of hope that it is, but we got to keep doing it too. And, mm -hmm. and that's why we continue to work mm -hmm. together. So. so, Naomi, your title is a navigator. What does that mean? <clears throat> so Safe Harbor was passed, as I said, kind of in 2011. And this was um, a law that thankfully Minnesota took ownership of and said, we're not only going to pass this law, but we're going to give money um, to this and for services for those who have been victims of this crime. And so what that is, is that there are navigators throughout the state of Minnesota. There are eight regions. And so I cover eight counties, <clears throat> excuse me, that are in central Minnesota. And that's from down to Elk River, Wright, Sherburn, Benton, Stearns, Morrison, Aiken, and Crow Wing. Wow, that's a um, big area. Yeah, so kind of being are able you're the only one doing that in that area? In that area, yes, as the <clears> navigator. <throat> um, the other thing that they said is that not only do we ne need navigators that are going to help, um, whether it be child protection, giving them resources, whether it be um, a women's center or advocacy groups, um, school personnel, we want to make sure people are educated on the issue so they can identify it and then they can call us and we can help give resources um, to the youth that they may have identified. Um, the other thing is that they said that we need housing. That's something we're still getting more funding for because the truth is we do have many victims that are under the age of 18 years old that need housing. Um, some of them are in child protection cases, some of them are not, um, but they need a safe place to begin healing and restoring from what's going on um, and what has been going on. And they do say that the right now, um, the average age that somebody is tr is has a trafficker um, that kind of maybe forces them or courses them into this industry is 15 years old. Wow. So we're looking at a 15 year old and I think that that in itself, just thinking about somebody that young um, and being in a situation that they are forced to have sex night after night after night um, is just something that's really hard to digest. But thankfully um, our state is saying we need funding in order to best serve um, the people that have been victims of are, this. Are, the, are most of the victims that you deal with from Minnesota? Yeah, I would say for the most they are domestic. Um, at one time, you know, people maybe had this idea that sex trafficking was international um, or that it was only internationals that were being trafficked. Yes, that <coughs> is a problem, but the highest p percentage is going to be domestic. Um, and just sometimes from our area, sometimes it, you can have somebody that's from St. Cloud being trafficked up to Brainerd, to Duluth, to Fargo-Moorhead area, and all the towns in between and back. Um, but it really, there's also opportunity that traffickers will say, you know what, I have somebody right here that I can traffic on the weekends and they can be in school on Monday. Um, their family's wow. not gonna know what's going on, but I'm gonna make a profit off of them. Um, and so there are traffickers that are working in the area with youth from our area as well. So what, what we would consider in the old days as a John. Yes. Do you work with them too? Do you no. ever try to rehabilitate those folks? Yeah, so um, there's a program that's in St. Cloud at the, um, the Women's Center there, or sorry, the Sexual Assault Center there, and they have what they call the not, um, not buying at school. And so it, that's, it's not to say that we're gonna take charges away, but it's saying that you need to go to this class to understand what's going on. Um, because the truth is that this is supply and demand. If there was not a demand for this, it would not be happening. Right. It would cease to exist. So we know that we do need to focus on the demand and how can we stop this by focusing on the people that are buying um, and, and that are doing that. And um, one thing that they're learning, interesting enough, is that pornography is kind of fueling this industry. Um, and that's one of the things that has been unique across the board, um, which is why it's leading to younger ages, because we know that with the progression of pornography, um, it also leads to younger children. And so if they were once, um, it was a, a 30 year old that they're watching in pornography images, and now it's down to a child, that they are more likely than to go buy a child and want a child and, and solicit in these situations. Um, and so it all kind of intertwines into a big, issue of the commercial yeah, sexual and industry. That's kind of what I was getting at too when we first started this, you know, getting to the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and we've worked even through prosecution, you ask about treating the Johns. You know, there's, they call them John schools mm -hmm. as well. So when we did our um, operations at the hotels, it was all adults on, um, over the years now. Locally, I think it's close to 30 some adult males that we've arrested for solicitation charges. And in those prosecutions, you know, um, I don't know the exact numbers, but part of the prosecution was maybe to attend the John School. 
Um, a piece of that is the education. You know, I can't tell you how many times during the course of our work we heard, well, it's just two consenting adults, what's the problem? Well, it's so much bigger than that. I mean, it, it may be consenting adults at, at a level somewhere, but it, like Naomi, Naomi was explaining, it, it tends to, um, it becomes more criminal as people become used to it. And you know, that even that lady I, I spoke of earlier, you know, as we talked with her, the stories she was telling us, you know, things that have happened to her in a motel room while she's working, it, it was just amazing that, you know, as a late 20s gal, she's not been hurt. And she would be the first one to admit it, you know. So mm -hmm. again, it goes back to, okay, is she really consenting? Maybe now at this point in time. But through our conversations, we also learned that she didn't get into this on her own. She was trafficked out of St. Cloud. She was a college student down there. And, you know, now instead of getting a college education, she's stuck in this world. Now she doesn't know anything else. Now there's a lot of money coming in. She's dependent on she's that lifestyle. She's dependent on it, and she can't get away from it. Wow. So it's just this ugly cycle. And for us in law enforcement, we wanted to break that pattern. And that's kind of what we, we started to do and we committed to doing here. And, and across the state, you know, we received a grant at the same time Bemidji received a grant. Bemidji Police Department, uh, we were doing the same type of work. And it, it seems to be working, but now, you know, the focus is kind of changing again within the law enforcement world, um, kind of shifting towards the guardian angel aspect of it. That is where we specifically are getting into um, doing undercover work to go out and find the people who are specifically targeting juveniles. And um, that's, that's some interesting work too, and it's amazing. It's interesting because the people who are the Johns, mm -hmm. keep using that term, sorry. The but buyer. The <laughs> buyer. Um, it can be anyone. We saw a chief right. of police in Minnesota that was arrested for that. Mm -hmm. I fished with his neighbor mm -hmm. about a hmm. month ago, and it was devastating to that right. whole community. Uh, mm -hmm. A congressman in New York, uh, and he got into the pornography stuff too. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I've not made that connection as much as you're saying, Naomi, sure. that pornography has led to a lot of this developing right. because people are getting access to the younger picture. Right. What, what's the youngest victim you've dealt with? Uh, the youngest I've dealt with is a, I mean, how old has she been? 14 years old. Wow. Um, but again... So it, she had eighth grader, ninth grader? Yeah, about that, about ninth grade. Wow. Mm -hmm. And the other thing you look at is, um, you know, some of the youth, they say 15 years old, and so you're looking at very young. I know people that have worked with a lot younger that have worked with an eight-year-old or a four-year-old really? who have been trafficked. Um, really? and, that, and you really see that more when you're looking at familial trafficking, which is harder to detect and identify um, because it's been something that's going on within in the, the family. And it's in the house, and it's word of mouth. Um, and so it's not on Craigslist or Backpage.com that they're putting up ads um, and selling them. It's that it's through word of mouth. Somebody knows, I can go to that house and there's gonna be a young, a young girl or a young boy um, that are gonna be there and I can do what I want for this amount of money. And so again, when it's familiar, it's a little bit harder to detect and we know that that is very prevalent as well in a lot of communities. It is. Yeah, and, it, and a lot of times it can blend <clears throat> in with the drug world as well. I mean, a lot of that intersects in a lot of ways. You, you haven't made it sound like all of this is necessarily related to drugs. No. It's related to, like you said, just getting a place to mm -hmm. stay or I, I guess I've never, I, I, right. I've always thought that so much of this would be drug related. Sure. Somebody's and the doing work it. That, yeah, and the work that we did at the, <clears throat> the local motels, we kind of anticipated that maybe as we got into it, we were prepared. We had our drug task force agents who were there. Um, I don't know, I think maybe a handful of times or less did we actually come across individuals who had drugs on them or were you know, any way, mm -hmm. any sort of drug connection. So mm -hmm. that was kind of surprising yeah. to us yeah. too. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the list of individuals who we arrested was, it, it was somewhat broad, but somewhat narrow at the same time. I mean, it was a lot of the white males in that 25 to 60 year old age group that were wow. somewhat local. I mean, they traveled a little bit to, to get to the destination, but, um, 
I think now, you know, it, we worked hard on the front end too with the, the local newspaper. We wanted to make a big splash. Um, we wanted it to be deterrence, which was, I'll be honest, kind of hard on the officers because they really enjoyed doing the work. I mean, we couldn't believe how productive we were in that first hmm. detail that we we ran, and um, it, it was my call on the back end to bring the the paper in and have them that intimately involved from the front. And the deterrence worked; it really did. Hmm. Um, we dropped off almost immediately as we continued to work the details. So once they realized you were looking for them. Yeah, <laughs> but the problem is, and again, we knew that we weren't solving any issues. We were just probably pushing it elsewhere. So now I think a lot of our work is, is on the education side of it. Um, we're getting into kind of a risk assessment role too where how do we better identify the juveniles who, who are at risk, who may be victims. So who, um, who are they? Who is at risk? Right, and I think this is something um, <clears throat> that sometimes is hard to grasp, but all youth are essentially at risk for this. Um, traffickers can lure um, youth in on social media. That's a big thing. It can be on Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp. There's multiple different applications that are out there that parents aren't monitoring. Um, they don't even know how to sometimes operate the app, so they don't know who they're talking to. And you can be anyone behind a phone. Um, so the traffickers kind of lure them in through this um, love, adventure, I'm going to have a great life for you, reaching out at times when maybe a kid is like, my mother, beep, 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 and freaks out. And the trafficker at that point can step in and say, oh, honey, it's okay. What's going on right now? Let me have a conversation with you about that. You can trust me. Um, and they start to build this rapport with this youth until they get to a point um, that maybe they come in contact with them. And at that point, they're going to use violence and they're going to use fears and threats against their family. They might blackmail them and say, you know what? I have this picture of you and I'm going to show it to the rest of the world um, unless wow. you comply with me. Um, and so traffickers really, um, they're businessmen. They know they can make money off of this one person. Are the traffickers always men? For the most part, but not always. <coughs> I, actually, I shouldn't even say for the most part. No, we mm -hmm. oftentimes will see traffickers that are females. It doesn't make a difference, um, the gender. I would say the only gender that you're gonna see most prominently male is in the buyers, when we're looking at buyers. But when you're looking at traffickers, when you're looking at victims, um, they, are all, they could be anybody, um, all different ages as well. Um, and, and so again, they could make 100,000 dollars a year with one person. Wow. 100,000. And that's on like the, the low end. Um, so they're very tactful in who they're going to lure in and who, you know, wow. sometimes it can be those at risk youth, maybe families um, that are not engaged in their life that are out, you know, roaming around in the streets. It could be those that are runaways or the LGBT community. If they're not um, feeling that they belong somewhere, this person might be somebody that accepts them. So again, the traffickers are, tra are tactful. And bringing it back to the drugs, one thing I, I like to make the connection with and, um, is that you could exchange drugs for money or drugs for whatever, and those drugs are gone. You have a human being and you can use them over and over and over and over again. You don't give it away and it's gone. You have that person to use over and over again, which is why it's such a big money maker. Um, and so when you get into the mind of the trafficker, you realize that they don't care about this person and really they are just a price tag to them. Your commodity doesn't disappear. You always right. have it. Right, you right always there. have it. Wow. You control it. Do you see much disease? Yes, when you're looking at STDs and STIs, unwanted pregnancies, um, I worked with the youth and um, yeah, she, I mean, she ended up, she was pregnant and at, at the very beginning wasn't sure, you know, who, who the dad was. And, and that was really difficult for her and something sure. she had to, her whole pregnancy had to wonder and think about. And so you just think of all the different things that um, will be unexpected to somebody that just kind of ended up in this situation. What, what services do you have for the victims? Well, Minnesota's doing it right. Um, mm -hmm. they, they've thrown a lot of money at this and they continue to increase funding. We're very fortunate here in, in our area, in the Crow Wing County, Brainerd, Baxter area. Um, we've had, Naomi is our navigator now. She's, she's out of Brainerd, so that helps us. She talked about her eight counties. When we first started doing this, our first navigator, um, she had 22 counties. That, oh, wow. that, so <clears throat> as the state continues to build this out, they're doing it right. Um, the resources, we have the, the Saving Grace home, which I don't, we haven't even really talked about, but that's one of the foster homes specific to traffic youth. In the Brainerd area? In the mm -hmm. Brainerd Lakes area, and we've had that for a couple of years mm -hmm. now. For a while, that was one of the only outstate. I don't know right. if it still is, 
So we're, we're fortunate to have that here. Um, Lutheran Social Services has received more funding to hire another coordinator position. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're fortunate that way. What we see in law enforcement is in the metro area, the, the problem and the resources that they're putting toward, the problem is much greater there and the resources are probably two, three, four times what we're you know, sure. putting into it right now. But the BCA has just taken on in the last month and a half. Um, they've started to own this problem at a, I'm excited to talk about it because they've started their own human trafficking task force within the agency and they're, they're applying for additional funding and they're doing it right. They've reached out to the outstate communities, um, which sometimes, you know, we're outstate, we feel ignored, but they're making us feel like, okay, we understand the Metro is really attacking this problem. We need to cover our bases outstate too. So um, they're doing it right and, and they're bringing us in on that. We're so. down to a minute. Okay. <laughs> what should community people do? Who should they contact if they see something that makes them sure. suspicious? I would say, um, <clears throat> if, first of all, educate yourself so you know what to look for. And you can go to our Saving Grace, um, Lutheran Social Service Saving Grace on our Facebook page. Um, otherwise, you can you can always call us as well. We have a 24-7 hotline. And that's Lutheran Social Service. Lutheran Social, social Service. Services. <clears throat> Lutheran Social Services. And our 24-7 uh, hotline is one 866 824 three seven seven zero um, and that you can always call for us to give you more information give you identifiers um, let you know what to do in a situation that you think somebody something might be going on um, we can always consult with you otherwise we always say call you know call law enforcement call law enforcement they're they are in a position that they can respond and, and we are trained closely. now to deal with this right over and the last two years we've we've mm -hmm. done training specific to this um, in Baxter Brainerd uh, Crowing County area we've trained probably 75% or greater of our officers specific in a two to four hour course on this. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for yeah. coming on the show. It's very eye-opening and, and sad to see, but good to see that you're making progress in dealing with this issue. Thank you, thank both you. of you. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow, so long until next time.